Welcome back to the Value Investors Club's reading. This is not recommendation, only for educational purposes. Let's start right off. All credit goes to the VIC, especially to um, Driftwood, who is the person who filed this recommendation on September 4th, 2022. It is CNX Resources Corporation, CNX. Description. CNX Resources, CNX, is an investment opportunity where you don't need to believe much of anything to get a double or have a chance to get much more over time. CNX is one of the largest natural gas producers in the Appalachian Basin. It started out as the natural gas division of what is now Console Energy, a 150-year-old coal producer in the region. CNX participated in the explosive growth of the Appalachian Basin and became a standalone company in 2018. I think of CNX as a bit of an orphan security. At the time of the separation, they detailed their strategy to programmatically, I'm sorry, programmatically hedge as much of the natural gas exposure as possible. As a result, the typical oil and gas investor or generalist to- looks at their hedge book and sees the massive amount of volume hedged in the mid $2, um, over 70% for 2023 and 60% for 2024, versus $9 spot, and says, what a bunch of idiots, and moves on. Our originally own CNX midstream, which are viewed as cheap way to get a uh, as a cheap way to get exposure to the growth in the basin without being exposed to some of the craziness in the region. People seem to forget that the shale revolution was funded by a massive investment bubble that led to growth at any cost type drilling behavior. And the Palachian Basin, this gold rush mentality led to the growth at the limits of takeaway capacity, which kept a ceiling on national national natural gas pricing while creating chaos in Basin. Pricing approaching zero, forced shut-ins, etc. To CNX credit, uh, the management saw this uh, coming and wanted no part of it. Their view has uh, was that they had decades of drilling inventory and were the lowest cost producer in large part because they own all their midstream assets. The CEO tried to hammer this point home at the time of the CNX merger in 2022, uh, following a period of low prices. uh, 2020, I'm sorry. Quote, so if you look at the all-in cash cash expenditures for the entire company, you would get a per MCFE cost of approximately $1.41, which is well below the current gas realizations, which receive under the current forward strip, generating a substantial margin. What, and what is more, even more remarkable is looking at this every dollar spent cost method relative to our peers. As you may remember, we showed previously that the average cash production cost of our peers is approximately one dollar. I'm sorry, thirty-seven cents. So our everything and anything, all in cash expenditures for the year on an MCF basis, are basically equal to the average cash production costs of our peers. Let me say that one more time: our fully, fully burdened costs are in line with our peers' operating cash costs. Once you add in interest costs, SG&A costs, other operating expense costs, and the capital our peers need to spend each year to maintain flat production, our all-in cash cost per MCF is substantially below our competitors. This cost advantage ensures that CNX can operate successfully and produce substantial free cash flow at price strips where the peers cannot afford to hold the production flat and be cash flow neutral. I hold onto my shares after the merger and have accumulated more opportunistically, including at recent prices. I believe that CNX is an attractive investment at current levels based on the following. Undemanding valuation, market cap of 3.3 billion, net debt of the 2.2 billion, implies um, total enterprise value, EBITDA X of 3.9 X at current depressed hedge pricing. Conservative pr- operating strategy, one rate program to maintain production level at around 1.6 billion cash flow. Dividend, I can't I can really um, read it, I'm sorry. Um, BCF 
slash D, midstream assets fully owned, um, relative easy to increase production opportunistically if takeaway capacity opens up. 2022 um, EFCF of 700 million for current um, FCF yield in the low 20s, likely to be higher in the future based on continued opportunistic hedging leading to higher blended realizations than currently affected, reflected in the hedge book. Exceptionally focused capital allocation. Possible a natural gas re-rating. Not, uh, not necessary, but could be a nice kicker. Plenty of valid reasons, especially on the supply side. While all stocks, oil stocks, have traded at significant premiums on, an, um, on a BTU equivalent basis, but not sure why natural gas companies won't close the discount re uh, to re-rate given a um, much better long-term outlook. I will discuss some of these points further below, but we'll start with a brief overview of natural gas and the Appalachian Basin for those who aren't familiar with some of the history slash dynamics. Background. The US is by far the largest producer and consumer of natural gas in the world. Production, however, was stagnant for about 40 years starting in the 1970s. We see the U.S. Na annual natural gas production from 1940 to 2020 bi in billion cubic feet per day. It starts off in 1940 by around 10. Um, and now in 2020, um, we are at about 110. In the late 2000s, drilling in the Uticar and Marsilius shales of the Palachian Basin began in earnest and this happened. Uh, monthly U.S. dry shale natural gas production January um, 28 to June 2021 billion cubic feet per day, um, BCF by D. Um, um, we see in uh, it starts right about in like I would say 2009 ish to 2010. Um, where there's no um, where there's no uh, natural gas production um, in Appalachian dry shale natural gas um, and uh, in 2020 in 2020 um, December uh, it's a, a, by about um, 32 BCF per D. It's hard to overstate the significant, uh, significance of this. On its own, the Palachian Basin would be the third largest producer of natural gas in the world after the rest of the U.S. and Russia. It also single-handedly increased uh, U.S. production by 50%. As you can see below, U.S. consumption of natural gas began to track higher as this, as this new supply came online. U.S. natural uh, gas and consumption, dry production, and net imports 1950 to 2020, 1 trillion cubic feet. We start off in 1915, um, 1950, I'm sorry, um, with a production, consumption, and net imports, uh, imports at around um, 6 or 5.5 uh, trillion cubic feet. And um, now in 2021, um, the production is at about... 40 um the consumption is about 30 and the net imports are at about zero increased consumption has been primarily driven by natural gas usage for electric power generation unlike the bev threat hanging over the oil market the natural gas demand outlook seems much more robust it's very hard to see an alternative to natural gas for base load power generation in the foreseeable future. While wind and solar represents the majority of new power ads each year because they are cheaper before subsidies, natural gas plants continue to be built both for reliable base load and peaking purposes. U.S. natural gas consum consumption by sector 1915 to 2021 in trillion cubic feet um, start o starts off the residential at about... Um, one or two trillion cubic feet and is now at about three or four. Let me correct that at about five. Um, and the commercial uh, is at about, uh, started off at about, um, at about two, I'd say, um, and is now at eight. Uh, the industrial uh, started off at five and is now at um, around about 
1918, uh, the electric power started off, off also at 5 and is now at about almost almost 30. And the transportation started off at about um, 5 as well and is now at 30 as well. Slightly above, but just very, very slightly. The rest of the increase in natural production has been consumed by decreased imports from Canada and, of course, exports LNG. The before graphic I might not have um, explained correctly. Um, if you want to see it, just go to the Value Investors Club CNX Resources Corporation um, by Driftwood. Um, U.S. natural gas imports and export 1950 to 2021 in trillion cubic feet. Um, we see the imports um, in 1955 at zero. Now in 2021, there are at approximately um, three trillion cubic feet, um, slightly less. Um, the exports are uh, started off in 1950 uh, at almost nothing, um, and are now uh, rising to, uh, started rising, especially in uh, in the 2000s and the beginning in 2000, um, and are now at almost seven, at, at yeah, at almost seven, 6.7, 6 I would say. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Appalachian Basin, uh, production growth has consistently been uh, constrained by available takeaway uh, capacity, in the past, this has led to uh, chaotic in-basin pricing, shut-ins and the collapse of many smaller competitors. Numerous additional pipelines have been proposed and have failed, mostly for permitting related, uh, related NYMBY reasons. The Mountain Valley Pipeline was 90% completed in 2019 and required Mansion uh, to hold up uh, the 300 billion IRA bill to potentially get it over the finish line. While various new industrial uses and power plants will continue to increase the basin demand, future pipeline additions look unlikely in the near term. Um, as a result, all of the uh, large Appalachian basin producers are now following some version of the CNX playbook and have cut rigs to the level needed to maintain production while harvesting cash flows for debt paydowns, dividends, or buybacks. Current production in the region is being maintained with a third of the 2011 rig count. These changes have not only stabilized in Basin dynamics, but have also led to higher pricing on national levels. U.S. self-sufficiency, surplus in oil and gas is a significant, comp is a significant comp competitive advantage that seems to be lost in all the inflation noise. That is clearly not the case in Europe, which is almost completely dependent upon imports for its natural gas needs including about 15 BCF per D from Russia. This replacement uh, of that 15 BCF per D will likely um, result in significant tightness in the LNG market for many years and 30% of current LNG flows. Capital allocations. With 70, 700 million of free cash flow, it shouldn't be an Excel with to see that a double over the next four to five years fairly reasonable base case. One could argue that CNX is exposed to inflation since their revenues are largely fixed in the near term. With just 440 employees, 8 million revenue per employee that take that um take that apple or this um, most inflation will be tied to drilling and production costs a steel pipe diesel etc the 700 million uh, free cash flow figure already includes significant inflation this year about 30 to 50 million and it seems likely that any further inflation will be more than offset be higher by a higher price realizations as they layer on more higher priced edge hedges the real crux of the investment thesis is that the future FCF will um, almost certainly flow to shareholders in one form or another, preferably, preferably buybacks. I guess it shouldn't be surprising that management totally drank the Kool-Aid on, on creating shareholder value since their chairman is William Thornick, uh, Thorndike, uh, the guy who wrote The Outsiders. But I never came across a company so totally focused on prop, uh, proper capital allocation. If you read any of their transcript, transcripts, it's actually a bit jarring how much they talk about it and how thoughtful they are. 
Here's how managed and explained their operating philosoph philosophy after the midstream merger, a bit long, but well worth reading. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick Delewis. Um, Delu Liz, I'm sorry if I butchered the name. Uh, the president and CEO of CNX Resources in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. CNX Resources is the low-cost manufacturer of natural gas in the very prolific Appalachian Basin. What we are manufacturing, natural gas, what we're manufacturing, natural gas, has an outsized foundational impact on today's economy as well as tomorrow's. The reason it enjoys that position is that natural gas provides instant quality of life to society at scale. And it does it at a carbon intensity level that is better than most other competing, uh, competing I'm sorry, forms of energy, including wind and solar, I might point out. CNX Resources is poised to, to generate substantial free cash flow over the next seven years, as you'll see. How are we able to do that? We have a competitive mode that really boils down to four strategic advantages. First, I mentioned that we are a low-cost manufacturer in our business. Our costs are going to decline further as you look into the seven years. Second, we methodically uh, hedge our position production of tomorrow, looking in revenues today, which of course is a big piece of the puzzle to de-risk to de cash flow generation. Third, we are unique that we own our pipeline infrastructure which allows us to control our distribution, cha distribution chain from the point of manufacturing at the well head all the way to the sales point. And then last, we require low levels of capital intensity, capital reinvestments to sustain and have the free cash flow generation from uh, come to roost over the next seven years. Now, we're not just a low-cost manufacturer of a product vital for satiety. And we are not just sustain a substantial um, generator of free cash flow. We are also astute capital allocators. And what we are looking to do is to invest that free cash flow in the right places at the right times to optimize long-term intrinsic value per share of the company. That's what capital allocation, the astute capital allocation means to us. We're going to be ruthlessly rational when it comes to making those decisions and following the math. So I hope that you're interested in our company. We look and focus upon things, as I said, being a low-cost manufacturer of a product that's crucial for society and being a free cash flow generator and allocating that free cash flow generation under astute capital allocation methodologies, methodologies to solve and optimize the long-term intrinsic value per share of the company. If you're interested in those same types of things, give us a call and we'd love to talk to you in a more meaningful way. Also, I will point out that what we're not. We are not a traditional EMP company. We are not even a traditional energy company. So you're not going to see us focused on uh, solving for production growth. You're not going to see us being interested in becoming the largest producer in the basin of the or in the country. And you're not going to see us obsessing over short-term EMP-centric metrics whether they're performance for performance or financial you will see us obsessing on that long term intrinsic value per share of the company followed by cfo donald rush thanks nick and thanks for giving us a few minutes of your time today as nick said we are the low cost producer in the most prolific natural gas basin in the united states our competitive advantages are real and our future is bright we generate significant free cash flow and our culture and team is focused on allocating that free cash flow to grow our intrinsic value per share. All that translates into is uh, the phenomenal free cash flow yield and margin numbers you see on this page. It is, it is a simple story when you boil it down, starting with the product we sell, natural gas. Natural gas is a fundamental building block over a modern society with worldwide demand growth. It touches all aspects of our day-to-day -day lives and it has reshaped the geopolitical, economic and energy landscape in favor for the United States. It's the most socially, environmentally sustainable way to meet the world's energy needs. And it's irrefutably, irrefutably a long-term strategic asset for the United States of, the, uh, of America and will remain an important product for the world going forward. 
On to our 2021 numbers versus not just our industry peers, uh, peers uh, but the broader market as well. First and foremost, we produce a significant free cash flow. Take any industry or index we stack up in, in the top quartile or better for free cash flow yield. Our assets and commercial strategies generate top tier margins. And finally, our balance sheet is strong and getting stronger as we pay down debt to reach our 1.5x leverage target. And the best yet, and the best news yet, we expect these metrics to improve as time goes on. We have a competitive, and we have competitive modes to protect them. As Warren Buffett says, the fundamental basis of above average performance in the long run is sustainable competitive advantage. We want our investors to know that our competitive modes are real and they are sustainable for an extended period of time. It would take our competitors well over a decade and cost them several billion dollars to replicate our business model. I won't unpack each one of these, but let me touch on two that are critical. First, and most importantly, our vertical integration of owning our midstream pipeline systems is unique in our industry and creates a tremendous advantage. Our competitors have outsourced theirs to third parties, which results in high fixed operating costs and constant contractual disputes with limited negotiating leverage. Owning our own pipelines gives us cost gives us a cost stru structure that is almost 50% below the peer cost structure of the peers and it allows us to control our products from source to sale. This advantage is nearly impossible to replicate and will persist for decades to come. Second is pro programmatic hedging. We have the ability to sell our products years, products years in advance at a fixed price and due to our best in-class cost structure, look in a favorable margin stream. Very few industries from consumer packaged goods to industrials have this advantage. This tremendously de-risks our capital investments, locks in returns and creates predictably in our, our cash flow growth generation for years to come. Could come. Sorry. Uh, we now refer to our company as a free cash flow generating machine due to its predictability, uh, predictability and repeatability. repeatability. This cash flow will improve our balance sheets and as we pay down debt and we expect our free cash flows per share to grow at an amazing 20% per year and to be clear, this example assumes our stock price appreciates over 15% per year. Um, if for some reason our stock price grows slower or stays flat, our free cash flow per share would increase and our free cash flow yield would skyrocket higher. This all leads to an attractive range of potential outcomes if you invest in our stock. The simple math is uh, that over the next seven years, our expected free cash flow generation is enough to eliminate all of our debt and return hundreds of millions of dollars to our shareholders. This example, uh, example re will result in well over a 150% increase in our initial investment and continued ownership in a company expected to generate substantial free cash flow each and every year thereafter. That's a pretty good conservative case. And of course, there's plenty of upside based on investing the free cash flow we generate into higher ret uh, returning capital allocation opportunities or returning more of it to our shareholders sooner. And as the market starts valuing, valuing us at a reasonable free cash flow year, yield, our stock will quickly more than double. Ultimately, an investment in CNX has an expected solid low-risk-based return with tremendous amounts of additional upside. So boiling all this down, CNX is a phenomenal investment opportunity, especially considering the volatility and uncertainty of today's marketplace. We are lowest-cost manufacturer of natural gas, which is an incredibly important industry that is not stable but growing. And the combination of our competitive modes, our culture, and our high-caliber team will ensure success for years to come. This is the opportunity. We are CNX. Please give us a call. We'd love to have you not only as an investor, but a partner of ours for years to come. Thank you for your time. So that was a pitch. Here are the results from the Q2 earnings presentation. Um, balance sheet and hedge book drive capacity to retire shares and reduce bad debt. CNX has repurchased 37.3 million shares for 
536 million since Q3 2020 for an average price of $14.39. CNX has uh, reduced ad adjusted net debt by 315 million since Q3 2020. Free cash flow per share has doubled since then. Significant low risk free cash flow per share growth. 2020 to 2021 EVE um, free cash flow per year expected um, compounded, annual, compounded annual growth rate, uh, rate of 60% approximately. A sustainable business model drives significant consistent free cash flow generation. Free cash flow per share expected to double in 2026 compared to 2022. 30%. 31% um, uh, component annual growth return estimated free cash flow per share from 2020 to 2026 E. And here's how management explains the chart above and their thoughts going forward from the Q2 earnings call. This graph includes the, what we already have achieved and what we expected and what we expect moving forward. Looking back the last two years, we have already more than doubled our free cash flow per share since 2020. Looking forward, assuming a constant enterprise value and assuming 80% of future uh, free cash flow is allocated uh, to share repurchase repurchases and the remaining 20% to balance sheet management, total shares outstanding would reduce by an additional 54% while still achieving significant deleveraging. In other words, free cash flow per share doubles by 2026. Our leveraged rate our leverage rate declined to roughly 1x and the implied share price, again, assuming a constant enterprise value, would appreciate almost $40, $44 per share due to the rapid chain share count reduction. This potential share count reduction only accelerates as stock price appreciation does not keep pace with a decline in outstanding stairs, uh, shares. When you compare this proje projection to the 2020 free cash flow per share, you can see 2026 free cash flow per share is over five times higher. Valuation. Hopefully I made it clear that a double in the next Four to five years is a relatively conservative case for CNX for a CNX investor. I should point out that despite its hedge profile, it will likely trade in sympathy with natural gas prices, natural gas companies. With the company aggressively buy back stock, I will I view pullbacks as an opportunity for the company and investors. My case, my base case, assumes a constant um, total enterprise value, as does the math by management management above. I think there's a good amount of upside to that assumption. Any company that shows 20% plus first, any company that shows 20% plus uh, free cash flow yields over a long time of or over a long period of time is likely to get re-rated at some point. Second, the entire sector seems inexpensive, although the unhedged players will be very volatile if natural gas prices retreat. Third, if you squint hard enough at the chart below, you could argue that CNX has a footprint similar to many of the much larger players. CNX just chose a more conservative development plan in the go-go years. Not clear this much of a discount is warranted over time. Uh, my cam just died. I will continue. It's just uh, a few sentences more. Um... Fourth, oil companies have always traded much higher on an equivalent BTU basis with natural gas BTUs trading at three, two to three x oil BTUs in Europe. Europe, it's not clear that this discount makes as much sense as it used to. Fifth, the majors uh, like Chevron and Exxon are relatively pip squeaked in their net in the natural gas, uh, roughly the same size as CMNX for 300 to 400 billion companies. If they decide they need more clean fuel exposure, then valuations have significant upside. I do not I do not hold a position with the issuers such as employment, directorship, or consultancy. And I I and or others advise hold um I advise hold a material investment in this issuer's security catalyst. Continued buybacks. This is not my recommendation, um, but from the recommendation from Driftroot. Th uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much for um, leaving this recommendation, Driftroot. Um, check out the Value Investors Club and check out um, his side. There are also messages, um, so other people gave their opinion. Uh, tune in next time. My name is Timon Wunderlich. Thank you very much.